Hello, and thank you for listening to my talk um, for PyData about building a machine learning pipeline to detect plastics in the ocean using EOLearn. First of all, I'd just like to say a huge thank you for the organizers of PyData for putting on a great conference um, during these trying times. It really is a privilege to be able to talk here. My name is Stuart. Um, I work at an organization called Two Sigma, which is a financial sciences organization, which means that we are a company that employs a lot of data scientists and engineers to work on problems in the financial space. Part of Two Sigma is the data clinic where I work, which is a kind of unique aspect of the organization. Um, it's basically a pro bono wing of Two Sigma um, that's modeled after a legal clinic, but with data science and engineering. And what that means is that we partner with nonprofits, NGOs, um, government agencies, and academics, uh, basically MD in the, who's trying to do good in the world, but it's kind of resource constrained. And we put together teams within Two Sigma to work with those partners to help them solve the problems they have and better serve their communities. We also conduct in the core data clinic team, um, which I'm part member of, um, self-driven research and tooling to, that contributes to the data for good movement. So we do a whole range of different things. We are sector agnostic, so we've worked with um, environmental partners like the Environmental Defense Fund, um, social justice organizations like the Beer Institute of Justice, and education partners like Robin Hood. So if you have a project that you may be interested in working with us on, please reach out regardless of where it lies in the spectrum. Today, however, I'm very happy to be talking about a project we ran this past year with the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, um, uh, particularly with uh, Lauren and Daniel and a bunch of the other researchers there. Um, we work with them to help them evolve a process that they already had for finding plastic in coastal waters using satellite data. What are microplastics? Um, well, this is kind of what they were looking for. And microplastics serves as a term for kind of these larger, um, you know, pieces of plastic in the ocean. Um, they can be anything from like bottles to, you know, like plastic waste, industrial plastic waste, basically anything which is kind of large made of plastic and find its way into the ocean. Um, these can be caused by, you know, weather sweeping, um, you know, uh, trash out to sea after some major weather event like flooding or like a hurricane. It could be, you know, boats dumping this over their side, but basically it's lots of plastic pollution that ends up in our oceans. And that's a huge project problem because it can be ingested by marine life which can harm them. It can get entangled with other debris and sink to the bottom of the ocean, which makes it very hard to clean up. Or over time, it can degrade into microplastics, which get into our food chain through marine um, animals and also to our drinking water. So there's a lot of you know, negative side effects for having this kind of plastic in the oceans. And so you know, the first step to dealing with this problem is to really sort of detect and monitor where these plastics are um, in the oceans. And that's something that's very impractical to do from ships, um, you know, just sending out surveys of ships, um, because they can only cover so much ground and the ocean is pretty huge. Um, and so the Plymouth Marine Lab were exploring whether or not this was possible to do from space, from satellite imagery. And before we dig into that, I wanted to take a step back and just kind of recognize that, you know, this is probably around the first time in history that this kind of project would be possible. Um, and that's true for a lot of other projects um, and a lot of projects that you may be interested in working on um, because there's been such an explosion in satellite um, uh, satellites up there that are monitoring the Earth, so Earth monitoring satellites. So just to give you an idea of how that growth has changed over the past 10 years and enabled projects like this one today, um, in 2014, there was about 1,200 satellites in orbit, 200 of which um, were um, you know, tasked with the Earth's obs observation. In 2018, that had um, got up to 2,000 satellites in orbit, about 700 of which were for Earth observation. So in four years, that's an increase of about 250%, mostly driven by very small CubeSats, which are these very cheap to build and launch and deploy satellites um, that form these constellations that can image the Earth um, from, from space fairly regularly. And this has only increased in number. And so as a data scientist watching this talk, this is like a really exciting new um, data source that we can use for a lot of our problems. And it's got a really, well, the satellite data and this kind of, you know, this explosion of satellite data really has some very attractive qualities to it. Um, so we've got to the point now where there's so many satellites up there and some of the satellites are, are kind of moving so fast and imaging so fast that we really do have almost like a daily cadence of data coming to us. So these satellites whiz around the earth, they take images and they whiz around again, take another image and the cadence can be between one to two to three days, um, meaning we get update, up to date data from um, like satellites fairly frequently. This is two great advantages. One is that if something has just happened, we can find data about it. We can get satellite images for that region, you know, after the event really quickly, which is great for humanity humanitarian aid and humanitarian purposes. But we can also monitor things over time. So we can actually take snapshots every day, every two days, every week, and see how things are changing in the environment, which again is a huge win for us as data scientists. The other two great advantages are one that these 
satellites not only take images just in the sort of standard red, green, blue that we're used to thinking about with machine learning, but actually in way more different spectral ranges than that. Most of these satellites can see things in the infrared, far infrared, near infrared, a kind of combination of all these things, which can help us pin down extra properties of what we're seeing through the satellite. Things like what materials are present in the pixel, you know, is there vegetation there, is there not vegetation there, is the vegetation healthy, etc. And then the final big advantage is that because these satellites are imaging the entire world pretty much um, at this point, um, we have data globally. You know, a lot of these sources have global data. Um, and this is really important because for a lot of um, social impact projects, um, especially in developing countries, we we may not actually have much data coming from uh, the government of those countries or the statistical agencies of those countries. Sometimes even things like population data or population um, distribution and density can be uh, not great from places like this. And so satellite data might be the only data we have that is kind of reliable and readily available. To give you a couple of ideas of what people do with satellite data and machine learning in particular, um, I wanted to highlight two projects I think are really cool. One is this project called Blue Dot, which uses Sentinel satellite data, um, which is a type of uh, one of the satellites we're going to be talking a lot more about, and machine learning to detect bodies of water in satellite images. So it uses machine learning to trace out the extent of the body of water, and it does that every time that that satellite passes over. So if the water starts to evaporate and the um, water body starts to shrink, um, we can actually tell that in real time. And this provides near real time monitoring to identify problems that might be um, resulting from drought, drought or flooding. Um, and it like, allows those problems to be addressed very, very quickly, which is great. A similar project in the social space um, actually came from Microsoft over the past five or six years, I think, they've been working on it, um, where they've taken satellite images and used machine learning to identify building footprints within those satellite images. So you can see here all these yellow outlines are of buildings from this one region of satellite image. These uh, serve as a proxy for population where we find buildings, we expect to find people. And again, that can be really useful um, for countries where we don't have great population density data sets. We don't really know where the population is um, because, again, like the data collection maybe isn't as good as we'd expect it to be there or like it to be there. So this is really important for targeting aid, for targeting humanitarian response after certain crises, and also for just like mapping out population and population density during like a COVID outbreak that we're seeing you know, around the world these days. So again, it's a data set and a result that we could only really get using kind of these modern uh, machine learning techniques with satellite data. But as a data scientist coming to work with this, you should be aware of some challenges. So as a you know data scientist myself, um, working on this project, we had a number of different hurdles that are really kind of tricky as somebody who doesn't have experience with Earth observation to overcome. The first of these is just that a lot of this data comes in specialized data formats. Um, so things like uh, SNAP, NetCDF, and a whole bunch of other ones that are designed for the Earth observation ecosystem, which usually includes um, GUI-based tools rather than data science workflows. Even before dealing with those data formats, you also have to find the data, um, which is also very tricky. Um, there's a lot of it out there. But knowing whether a certain satellite imaged a certain part of the world at a certain time can actually be kind of tricky to understand and, and, and sort of discover. Um, and so we need ways of doing that that kind of are very friendly to the data science workflow. And finally, um, a lot of this data to be useful in just the same way as a lot of data needs to be you know, cleaned and processed to be useful for machine learning, that's true of satellite data as well. So before we can use it, it needs to be cleaned, and that has to be a specialized process of calibrating the images, correcting for the effect of the atmosphere, um, and a whole bunch of other things that really need somebody who knows what they're doing with satellite images to, to perform. And so these can be hurdles with using this data. And these are hurdles I really detect, you know, went through when working with this process with PML. But let's get back to their story. Let's get back to the story of finding these plastics in the ocean. So again, um, we need to answer this question, is it possible to detect and monitor microplastics from space? That was really kind of what PML was looking to, to explore um, when they first started their research. Um, and the first thing they did was identify satellites that may be suitable for this um, task. And the ones that they um, narrowed in on were the Sentinel-2 satellites. And there's some good reasons for that. Firstly, they're built and run by the European Space Agency, which means that all the images that they generate are made freely available for analysis by anybody. So you can go online today and get access to the Sentinel-2 satellite images like that. It's really easy and it's, it's, it's a great resource. They also have multiple spectral bands, in particular spectral bands that are important for detecting plastics, which again is, is, is you know, a great plus for this um, task. And they have a two to three day cadence, which means that we get to see the same part of the world over and over again pretty quickly. So as a monitoring tool, they become very, very useful. On the downside, the Sentinel-2 satellites were mostly designed for imaging of land, which means a lot of the software and a lot of the techniques and a lot of the, the um, data packaging is really aimed at monitoring land-based usages. Um, they do image coastal regions, which makes them appropriate for what we're trying to do here. Um, but that's kind of a, a limitation that we kind of have to think about and overcome. And finally, the resolution of the satellites is 10, 10 meters per pixel, 
which is actually pretty decent. Um, but like as we'll see, it's not quite like small enough to really resolve these macrobiotics individually. And so again, that could be a concern. And so let's take a look at that last problem in a little bit more detail. Here's a picture of a scene from the ocean. We've got a nice diver for scale. Um, and you can see here, we've got a bunch of different macroplastics um, floating on the surface. Um, they're surrounded by seaweed and by uh, timber and a bunch of other things, but we can clearly see the plastics. And if this was the, the quality of our data, then we'd have no problem solving this, pro you know, solving this problem. We'd just you know, write some computer vision techniques and we'd pick those out and we'd be good to go and we could monitor plastic around the world. The unfortunate thing is that um, the Sentinel satellites, as I said, have a 10 meter by 10 meter um, pixel size. And so one pixel that we get from an image from the Sentinel satellites covers roughly the square area you can see here. And the diver and all the material you saw there before is actually contained in this image. You can see sort of see them there. So like this, that entire region we just saw before just kind of fits in the bottom part of the image here. So this is quite a large pixel. And so what we see is we see the reflectance data, the reflected light, not just from the plastic, but the wood, the water, and everything else within this pixel. So what we really need is sub-pixel detection. We need to say, does this pixel contain plastic, even though we can't see the individual pieces of plastic? And to do that, we need some examples of what plastic look like, looks like to these telescopes. So that's what it, these satellites. Um, so this is where um, some previous research had been done by the Marine, Marine Remote Sensing Group um, with the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Aegean. Um, they were also interested in this, this topic. And so what they did was they, they made a quite um, clever experiment where they took three um, like rafts, basically, of plastic. So they created these um, like bundles of plastic wrapped up in nets and anchored them outside of their research facility and waited for one of the Sentinel satellites to pass over. When they did that, they captured an image like this, and you can see that we can just about make out those plastic rafts. But I will say that these are much, much larger than the, the image we saw before, and much more concentrated in terms of plastic than what we saw before. If we zoom in, you can see kind of the problem in depth. Um, here are the three different rafts um, that they put out, and you can see that these are the pixels that cover them. Um, these images here are high resolution images taken from, a, a, I think, a plane pass, um, but these are the sentinel images. So again, as you can see, we can only sort of just about resolve the rafts in like four pixels. And those pixels contain water, they contain varying water quality. So you can see other features here. They're going to get mixed in with the data from the plastics um, and everything else. So it's a hard task to separate these out. However, this does give us, um, you know, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pixels, um, which contain plastics that we can use at least to give us some kind of ground truth. Um, uh, that's not enough for training any kind of model. Um, and so, what the Plymouth Marine Lab group did, which I think was like really inspired, was they went out and actually surveyed um, social media, um, surveyed their contacts, um, surveyed a whole bunch of people for instances that they knew about where plastics had been washed out into the ocean. So, for example, in this case, um, after severe flooding, um, this was, uh, you know, some images that were taken of this kind of material being swept out to sea. And they were able to follow up using Sentinel satellite um, uh, passes, these areas, identify pixels that had a higher probability of being plastic, and clean those to the point whereby they were relatively confident those pixels contain plastic to increase the number of training data points that they had to work with. They also labeled um, empty water, just plain water, um, pixels that they thought had uh, timber, they thought had seaweeds and sort of you know um, white caps from like waves and things like that as well. So eventually they created created a fairly small, fairly um, uh, like um, localized and and cleaned um, sort of training data set for this problem. Um, and one of the things that you notice when you look at that training data set and you look again, not just at the images themselves, but their spectra. So this multispectral imaging allows us to get these multiple data points for the reflected light. We can see here the empty water looks something like this line. And then all these other debris, which might be floating on top of it, things like um, you know, uh, seaweeds, timber, or plastic, um, uh, sea foam, which we call spume, or rock, um, they all have um, kind of very distinct um, spectral signatures um, over and above the water. And so what Lauren and her team at the PML um, did um, was they defined this floating debris index. So this is an index, which is some combination of these spectral um, uh, lines, which is particularly good at identifying whether there's something floating on the surface of the water or not. And so they called it this um, floating debris index. This is all published in their um, paper um, in the National Scientific Reports, if you want to read more details about that. And what they also showed in that paper was that if you combine this floating debris index with the um, NDVI vegetation index, which is another index which tells you whether or not there's vegetation within a given pixel or not, and um, how much vegetation there is, um, you could begin to separate out 
you know, particularly in this very clean, very sort of, you know, targeted training data set, the different types of material that were floating on the surface. So, you know, things like seaweed look a little bit more distinct from timber, that look a little bit more distinct from plastic. And what they did then was they used this training data set, um, which again, admittedly is fairly small and fairly localized. A lot of these um, samples come from the same edges and the same locations. Um, they were able to train a naive base classifier to try and predict where a, a particular pixel had plastics or not. And that was great. And they published that basically as a proof of concept, showing that this works and showing that this is potentially a viable way to detect plastics from space. And that's kind of where we got involved. Um, we read about their research in a BBC News article, and we thought it was really interesting and really wanted to work with them on this problem. So we reached out and uh, over a number of conversations, scoped out two major challenges that they had. The first one was actually just scaling the analysis up. So historically, the team was performing all these tasks manually, you know, like downloading the images, loading them into some software, selecting the pixels they thought were high, you know, high caliber plastic pixels and everything else, exporting that in an Excel spreadsheet, loading that in and running the machine learning um, pipeline. And it was very slow. It took a lot of time to sort of, you know, um, make sure that all these data points were clean, et cetera. And they couldn't really apply it to like larger areas. It was tricky to sort of actually scale this up and use it as a detection algorithm. And the second one uh, challenge they came to us with was the fact that what they began to see and what we saw evidence of as well is that because all of these data points were taken from roughly the same locations, some of the information about the atmosphere and some of the information about the water um, that was also mixed in with these plastic targets was being kind of encoded into the machine learning algorithm. So it was kind of overfit for these particular locations and wasn't generalizing very well to other locations. And so really what we wanted to do was um, develop a data-driven atmospheric correction um, that would uh, try and remove that like inhomogeneity between the images and allow the model to produce much better results. So the challenge, the first challenge, scaling up the analysis, this was um, pretty scary for us um, coming in as people who haven't used a lot of Earth observation data before. Um, but we were up to the task and we did some research and we found the EO Learn package. And this was a huge help. This was like a, a really, really great um, discovery um, because what it was going to do is it was going to give us a very um, well thought out, very well constructed platform um, that would make accessing the data easier, creating pipelines of cleaning for the data much easier and like something that we could customize for our own um, our own sort of you know flows. And so EOLearn, if, if you're looking to do anything with like um, satellite data and machine learning, I would highly recommend you take a look at it as a way to structure your code and structure your processes in such a way that it gives you a common standard for, for working with stuff. What it basically gives you is three different types of abstractions. Um, an EO patch is basically the abstraction for the data itself. So it's a standard that can, is a standard container for data for a certain geographic region and time range. And it can store raster data, which is the individual pixel values, like you know, how red is this, how green is this, how near infrared is this. Um, it can store vector data, so shapes, and it can also store metadata about a, a sort of an image and region as well. EO patches are operated on by EO tasks, which is a framework for basically transforming an EO patch. So an EO task will take in a EO patch as an, as a, a, an input. It will do some work in it. It may add in new layers. Um, so you know maybe we start off with red, green, and blue, and then we add in um, the floating debris index, and we add in the NDVI index, that which become new layers within the EO patch. And then what it does is it ex like um, outputs an EO task as well. So there's a, now a format that's the same as before, but perhaps with new layers or updated features on existing layers. And finally, EO Learn gives us a workflow um, abstraction, which means we can compose these EO tasks into larger analyses um, and run them as like one full packaged pipeline, which is really great as well. So in terms of how this helps to scale things up, well, what it allows us to do is it allows us to um, feed in our region, say for the example, this region around Scotland. It allows us to um, chunk it up into like little EO patches, little like chunks here, and um, get rid of the ones that are part of the land and not the ocean, and then just iterate over these in a parallel process to just process each little patch here. I'll say that we do have some overlap between these patches, so there's no edge effects, which will become important later when we talk about the local normalization. And so in each one of those EO patches, we get um, a number of different pieces of information. And this is kind of what your typical EO patch will look like. We have then the bottom here, some context information. So we have a bounding box, which tells us the region of the planet that this um, EO patch covers. And we have a timestamp, which tells us um, when the satellite passed over that um, chunk of land. 
The meat of the EO patch is our data um, property here, which contains all of the different um, pieces of information we have about the pixels within the image. So for example, here we have bands from the Sentinel-2 satellite, so all the different colors that it can see. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that we've added in through running this EO patch through different EO tasks. But these are all just NumPy arrays. And so any piece of the Python ecosystem you can use to manipulate an NumPy array, you can use to manipulate part of these EO patches. And then finally, we can also store masks on there. And masks are really useful for um, like including or excluding pixels from our analysis. So for example, in our case, we don't really care about the land. And so one thing we can do is we can add in a mask that just says all of these pixels that have one in this mask are the land, whereas everything else is the ocean. And so go after the ocean pixels rather than the land pixels. And all this gets carried through the analysis. So you always have this data at your fingertips when you're processing something. And that brings us to EO tasks, the thing we use to actually process the data. Now, out of the box, EO Learn as a, as a package gives us a lot of um, ready-made um, EO tasks just to use. So the first one, and probably the most useful one, the one you find yourself using the most, is this input task, where we can basically retrieve the values for the Sentinel satellite uh, images um, using a, a service called Sentinel Hub, um, which is run by the same people who make EO Learn. There is paid tiers in this, but there's also a free tier if you want to try things out and, and play around with it. And it makes accessing this data way easier than, than trying to do it from the raw files. Other common EO tasks are things like adding common indexes. So for example, we talked before about the NDVI, the Normalized, data, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, um, which is actually a EO task that we can just run on our data to add that in as a layer in our EO patch. And that means that we don't have to code it ourselves. We don't have to like worry that we made a mistake in calculating that, and it's just there for us to use. And then finally, there's also some pre-trained models for masking out clouds and for identifying whether pixels are land, whether there is sort of, you know, vegetation on land, et cetera. And so there's a lot of like really good um, stuff that comes out of the box that we don't have to reinvent, which is great. So we can focus on what makes our problem different. Of course, when we hit those differences, we have to implement our own EO tasks. And uh, EO Learn makes that very easy as well. So basically, all we do is we subclass the EO task class, and we define an execution method here. The execution method at runtime gets past the previous steps EO patch, um, and also any parameters that we've defined in here. So for example, we're defining two parameters, band layers and band names in here that we can pass in um, to this EO task when it's run in the workflow. And then what we do is we can extract from that EO patch um, the data we're interested in. In this case, we're grabbing three of the different bands from the Sentinel satellite data. And then we can perform some calculation. And in this calculation, we're actually implementing the floating debris index we talked about before. So this index that Lauren and the, the folks at PML came up with to identify things floating on the surface of the ocean. And so this then basically adds that to the EO um, patch as a layer which we can use in further analysis and ultimately in the machine learning step. And then basically what we do is we return this new EO patch with an added feature, which we call FDI, which is then made available to other steps in the process. And then finally, we compose these things together into workflows. A workflow is just a list or a list of tasks, um, which will be performed in order. Um, uh, and each one of those tasks gets run in order and is passed through arguments um, using the execute um, uh, function here. So this will basically run through each of these tasks in order. And whenever it gets to named tasks like this, it will pass in these parameters as those input parameters. So for example, our input task will take a bounding box, so a little region of the planet, and a time range to grab data from, and it will return any data that they have from Sentinel satellites for that region at that time interval. For example, this local norm method, which we'll talk a little bit about in a second, um, takes in uh, methods and a window size. And again, that gets passed to the, the EO task that's running that at execution time. And that is really important because it means we can tweak our analysis um, without having to rewrite an entire new workflow. We can just tweak the parameters, which is fantastic. And then finally, the results come out as an EO patch as well, which we can use um, either as part of another an input for another workflow or just to analyze with other Python packages and other Python tools. And so what we do is we, we actually define two workflows. We define a training workflow and a prediction workflow. Now, EO Learn gives you the ability to actually do the training in the loop of using the satellite data. We actually take a slightly different approach where what we do is we put it through all the processing steps that we need to do. So downloading the patches where we've identified training data, calculating those indices like the FDI index and the NDVI index, generating mass for water and clouds, um, applying this local normalization step, which I'll get to in a minute, and then exports the, all the pixels that contain training data as a data frame. And we just then use scikit-learn to run the machine learning on that data frame. So that's, that's super simple. That's mostly about just getting data into a clean format 
for our machine learning um, uh, like uh, pipeline. And then the prediction workflow actually downloads the patches for any region that we're interested in predicting, does the same thing, calculates the indexes, generates masks, and applies local normalization, um, which creates the same data format as our training workflow. And then we apply the model to generate the labels of the different types of things we're after um, within the EO, uh, EO task um, system. And the way we do that is we just define a new EO task called the Tech Plastics. On initialization, we load in the model file. And here we're just loading in a, a scikit-learn job lib file. But this could be a TensorFlow model or whatever you want. We're loading that in once and adding it to the class. And then our execute method basically just extracts the data from the previous parts of the pipeline that we are interested in using and um, feeds those into our machine learning model and then adds the classifications onto the EOLearn task as an output. And that's kind of our full process for predicting where plastics might be. So we did all that, which was great. And that allowed us to apply what um, the Plymouth Marine Lab had worked on and their model to these larger areas. And I, when we did that, you know, as often the case, when you scale things up, you start to see um, some problems with the model. And this was um, actually reflecting the second thing they had asked us to work on, which is that these um, training data points had come from very specific, very similar locations. And some of the, the sort of background water and the conditions of the atmosphere were kind of getting baked into some of that detection, um, like logic in the model um, and overfitting basically to those regions. So when we applied it to this area of Scotland, this quite large area that we saw before, what we started to notice was that a lot of these pixels were being correctly labeled as water, but a lot of them here were being labeled as spume, which is kind of like uh, basically this, this sort of, you know, foam on top of water. And the reason for that is if you look here, the water quality closer into the coast is actually lighter. There's more like particulate matter in there, which is causing a difference in the color of the water. And the model hadn't really seen much of that before. And so it kind of overfit and was like producing incorrect results for these patches of water. And so what we really wanted to do was come up with a data-driven way of normalizing the data in such a way that the model could distinguish better what was water and what was um, basically floating debris. Um, we ended up choosing a way to do this, which kind of ignores traditional atmospheric correction and just takes a completely data-driven approach. So the approach is to take a target pixel, um, this one here in the middle, and say, OK, um, we're going to take a window around that of a given size. And what we know about that window is it may contain other bits of plastic or it may contain other bits of timber and things like that. But most of those pixels are going to be water. Most of those pixels are just going to be plain old water. And what we want to do is we want to kind of get a standard um, template for what water looks like that can be that can be given to the machine learning model that's the same no matter where we're applying the, the, the analysis. And so what we can say is, well, we'll make the assertion that we expect water to have a floating debris index of zero because there's no debris there. We'll get, we expect it to have an NDVI of zero because there's no vegetation there. And on average, we should expect that to be the case um, over a large window around our target pixel. And so what we can do is we can calculate the average of these values over our target window here. And it may be slightly off from zero, zero. And so all we do is we make a correction for that in our measurements before we apply this to the machine learning step. And this helps us kind of smooth out any background variations in the water and allows us just to focus on the difference between the water and the things floating in it. And so again, we just need to create an EO task to allow us to do that, a custom EO task allows us to do that. Here it's called local normalization. And in this case, it's a little bit more complicated. But basically, what we're doing in the normalize step here, which gets run in execute, is we're basically um, using the mask that we saw before to get rid of any land pixels or any cloud pixels, which we don't want to include in our average. And then we're using some functions from SciPy and the image here to create this moving average. Uh, filter, um, which will then um, create the average for each pixel within the window around it, excluding um, clouds and land. And then we can subtract that off the um, current pixel within the scene. And what that allows us to do then is apply that to our NDVI and FDI and some of the other bands to kind of normalize out the background water. And then we basically can return that to the next step in the process, which then becomes part of our machine learning pipeline. To give you a visual idea of what that looks like, here's an image kind of before processing. Here's the NDVI values from there that we want to normalize out. And you can see that the water here is a little bit darker. It's a little bit lighter here. And we have this kind of artifact from the processing um, of the satellite images. And so if we apply this local normalization, we kind of flatten that out. We kind of like zero field it so that there's a common contrast between the material and the, um, the water. And you can see here that helps a lot with the image. It also helps a lot with the NDVI-FDI relationship, which is kind of a big part of what our model is detecting. So you can see here when we don't have any uncorrect, when we have uncorrected data, when there's no atmospheric correction and we're not doing this, the water pixels in blue here and the plastic pixels are kind of all mixed in together and it makes it very hard to define a, a decision boundary for these guys. And um, whereas once we apply this um, normalizing function, we actually see much more of a separation of the water and the plastics. And that helps us identify better what um, pixels may possibly be plastics. <laughs> 
And we do pretty well with this, um, applying this uh, model to, you know, using this local normalization and then an EU-based classifier, much like um, PML did, we were able to get to about 88% precision. Um, so we're fairly confident that when we label something a plastic, it is a plastic. Our recall isn't great. We miss a lot of things, but that's okay at this early stage because really what we want to do is build up more examples of plastic in the ocean to like buffer out our um, training um, data set to make it our models more robust in the future. So we choose precision over recall for that. And you can see here that it really gets rid of this um, uh, overfitting problem and this misclassification problem. This same region of Scotland here now zoomed in a little bit where we had this lighter water that was being misclassified as spoon before in the original model. Now with this locally normalized version, we actually remove all that from um, the classification and we get um, these pixels classified correctly as water. There's some land in here as well, but we can just ignore that. And then we can take that model and apply it pretty much anywhere. Now that it's robust to different water um, qualities in different locations and different atmospheric collections, um, we can apply it somewhere like Ghana, which is completely different from what we uh, had in our input um, uh, stuff. And we can detect things like this, this beautiful front, like the one we saw before in the image where we're seeing a lot of um, plastic debris and then also some like timber and other things. So you know, we're able to use this to now detect new um, clusters of plastics and satellite images. So it's been a really great project. Um, we, like we just, you know, helped PML operationalize this, turn it into like a data science pipeline, and added in this like really interesting uh, local normalization feature. But we couldn't have done it without EO Learn, which is a really fantastic, you know, package and an ecosystem for doing this. And um, it provides this really flexible um, set of abstractions that take care of data retrieval, common corrections, and calculations. And that means you can really focus on the custom parts of your analysis. Um, it also means that we can now take everything we've done, um, which we've open sourced, so this entire plastic detection pipeline we open sourced and people can take parts of that they can be take just the eo learn uh, so the um, fdi eo um, uh, task um, or the uh, detect plastics eo task or the local anonymization eo task and apply that to their own like pipelines and we think that there might be interesting use cases for this kind of um this kind of approach in other domains and others of uh, use cases. And really kind of the great thing about EOL Learn is it bridges this, this gap between the Python ecosystems for Earth observation and for machine learning. And that's that's huge. For us, the next steps in this model, this process are going to be building up a larger training data set of expertly confirmed labels. And um, we're going to use our current model to do that. So image new areas, detect things that are likely to be plastics, ask the ex experts to um, verify that, and then use that as new training data sets for new models. Um, we also really want to release a generic um, moving window, you'll learn task, which you can look forward to in the future. Um, and we're really hoping to get to the place where we can start live monitoring sites for where we know plastic has been a problem and use that to kind of track and start to deal with this issue in our oceans. Um, that's my talk. I hope you find it interesting. I hope you go away and try you learn. Um, it's it's fantastic if you're a data scientist and you, or you're just getting into this and you want to like experiment with using satellite data um, to do something. I can highly recommend it. Their documentation is great. They're, they've got lots of use cases on their website. Hopefully, this is another use case you can use to explore that. And um, this is our GitHub where the data pipeline is um, all open sourced. And if you're interested in working with us at the data clinic on a project that you have, if you just want, you know have a little bit of something that you need to get done and you haven't had the time or the resources to do it, please reach out to us uh, um, on our email or on Twitter or on our website. Thank you so much again for listening to this talk. Um, I'll be available for Q&As in the Q&A session, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your PyData.